Hi, I'm Graham. Welcome to the channel. Um, I'm a 62 year old man that has been fighting uh, hair loss for over 40 years successfully, uh, or at least with some degree of success. Um, and I started this channel to share the lessons I've learned. Um, I'm not a doctor, uh, but I do have degrees in computer science and chemistry. And those have greatly impacted my research and enabled me to come up with somewhat unique solutions, I think, to the problems that many of us face. The second video in this series, I was going to focus on a summary of what we know today on, on the overall problem or pattern of, of male pattern baldness, how it occurs, uh, and what we just know in the different uh, dimensions of that. Um, but given the, uh, the interest currently in the use of oral minoxidil, um, I wanted to dive deeper into uh, into that area. Um, this this really started happening uh, following a, an article in New York Times in, in 2022. Um, uh, people start talking it as a magical solution to, uh, to male pattern baldness. Um, it definitely assists, um, but I think we need to explore a little bit about the difference between oral minoxidil, the various forms of topical minoxidils uh, to really get a better picture of that. Um, so that's what I'm going to focus on today. Um, and really Im importantly, I'm not going to focus on the mechanisms of minoxidil. Many of these are still unknown. Um, as you can see from the, uh, the diagram I'm showing here, um, there are some pretty complex uh, pathways uh, and theories, I think, that are, are still yet to be completely proved out. Um, but one thing we do know is um, some of the critical components that make some people good responders and others not responders. Uh, and importantly, I think there are things you can do, whether you're a good responder or whether you're a really poor responder uh, to topical minoxidil, there are things you can do to greatly enhance your success uh, with this treatment. That's what we're going to talk about today. So as an introduction, uh, minoxidil was introduced as an oral antihypertensive um, initially. And as a side effect, people found that it grew hair on various parts of the body, including the head. Um, and in the, and in the 1980s, um, minoxidil was introduced as an oral formulation uh, as Rogaine, as a brand name, um, with, you know, some success, I would say. I started using it myself um, in the 80s as well. Um, the underlying mechanism I mentioned is unclear, um, but People often cite things like potassium, potassium channel opening um, or vasodilation as, as some of those mechanisms. mechanisms. Um, in 2004, when I began my detailed research, we already knew that minoxidil was a prodrug um, and that the active metabolite was actually minoxidil sulfate. Um, and research studies have shown that, that minoxidil sulfate is some 14 times uh, more effective um, in its treatment of, of hair loss than minoxidil itself. Um, back in 2004, um, when I was doing my detailed research, um, I actually looked at buying some minoxidil sulfate and trying that as an, as an oral uh, treatment uh, on myself. At that time, it was over $1,000 a pound, um, and I moved on. Um, not just for that reason, but because I was having success in other areas. Now, many of us are very familiar with the role of 5-alpha reductase in the conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. And that blocking this transition with, with something like finasteride or dutasteride uh, is very beneficial in fighting hair loss. Now, with minoxidil, there is a comparable reaction, um, which is shown in, in this chart, um, which shows the chemical pathway to create minoxidil sulfate from your topical um, minoxidil solution. Now, there are three components um, in this process. Minoxidil itself as a precursor, um, PAPS, uh, the simple name, it's essentially it's a sulfur donor uh, to the process, um, and a sulfur transferase. Now, this is a family of enzymes. Um, there are many of them. Uh, the particular one um, that we associate with monoxidil to monoxidil sulfate transition um, is what they call salt. A 1A1, um, we'll talk about that. Um, now, salt 
1A1 turns out is the critical limiting component in this transformation. And studies have shown that hair growth with topical minoxidil is directly related to the quantity expressed in the follicle outer root sheath of your hair. Um, so high salt 1A1 equals a good response to topical minoxidil. Uh, conversely, low salt 1A1 uh, relates to poor response or no response to topical minoxidil. Now, salt 1A1 itself uh, is predominantly expressed in the human liver in our bodies. That's the, the organ that where it has the greatest concentration. It's used as part of the process of uh, removing um, things from the human body. Um, but it also exists in other organs. Uh, and as I mentioned, in particular in, in the uh, hair follicle. Now, knowing that this is a limiting factor, um, what can we do to increase the transfer, the transformation from minoxidil to minoxidil sulfate at the hair? Um, or what can we do to stop things that we're doing from limiting uh, that transition? And what I want to do here is walk through some of those uh, elements. What this chart shows are the factors that will either impede or enhance the benefits of minoxidil um, on your hair regrowth, and in particular, how they actually impact this transition that we're talking about from minoxidil to minoxidil sulfate. So we'll start on the left-hand side, um, looking at the things that inhibit um, the, the actual transformation. And really there are, there are two um, that are often cited here. The first one is uh, aspirin. If you're taking um, a small amount of aspirin as part of your healthy heart regimen or, or your general health, um, that actually will impede the transition, the transfer from minoxidil to minoxidil sulfate. Similarly, uh, a family of, of chemicals called salicylates, um, which are found in many foods, uh, some listed here, uh, will also impact uh, that transition. Now, I think that these are definitely secondary factors for me, um, since I don't see a lot of difference between people with um, good hair and bad hair based upon the diet, how much coffee, tea, beer, or wine they drink. Um, but it's interesting that these are listed as uh, impediments to the transfer uh, of monoxyl to, to monoxyl sulfate. On the right-hand side are effectively the things that we know um, enhance the transition or will benefit um, the creation of monoxyl sulfate and use of monoxyl sulfate in the hair. So let's talk about these uh, in particular. Uh, the first one of these is um, oral monoxidil, uh, pretty inexpensive. Um, you take uh, 2.5 milligrams a day of this. Um, now, the way this works is actually different than your topical monoxidil. Um, this actually um, will, the transfer will occur, or the transition to monoxidil sulfate will occur in the liver. And the monoxidil sulfate reaches the hair follicle um, through platelets in the blood. Now, there is a lot of questions about um, whether or how that monoxyl sulfate can penetrate the hair follicle um, and the mechanism by which it does so. But the proof of the, is in the pudding. Uh, minox, or oral monoxyl um, and this creation of monoxyl sulfate in the blood or, or transfer through the blood really works. Um, so we, we know that this is, um, this is a viable pathway. The, the second one um, is not available in the United States, and that is uh, topical monoxidal sulfate uh, as, a, as a solution. Um, this is used quite widely in Brazil, um, and I don't know um, anything to do with the FDA regulations about when or how you might get this uh, in the United States market. Um, interestingly, there are a couple of points about this. Um, Minoxidil sulfate has a higher molecular weight than minoxidil. It's about 50% higher. Um, a lot of people uh, believe that this will impede uh, how, how the actual minoxidil sulfate will actually penetrate uh, the scalp and, and reach the, the hair follicle. Um, the second thing is that minoxidil sulfate uh, is unstable in aqueous solutions. 
Um, so there's questions about the stability of this drug um, as it actually, again, enters the human body. Now, that being said, there are trials with monoxidal sulfate that show 97% uh, of the population that it's tri uh, trialed on actually benefit significantly from using oral, oral monoxidal sulfate uh, at a 10% concentration. So this may be something that has a future in the United States market. Um, we'll see. Uh, maybe someone wants to move to Brazil and, and test it out for us. The, um, the, next, the next one on the list is uh, tretinoin, um, shown here. Uh, it's often used, most commonly used as uh, in skincare for a variety of, of skincare um, issues. Um, and this absolutely has been shown to upregulate the, the amount of salt 1A1 um, that you have in the outer sheath of the hair follicle. Uh, and therefore increase that transition from monoxyl to monoxyl sulfate. So this is something that you'll see used quite widely. Um, I use this predominantly um, on my temporal regions here to, uh, as I try and regrow the hair there. Um, it, it actually, tretinoin is, is retinoic acid. Um, so sometimes you'll see people use retinol or retinol A, um, and that will transition in the body to retinoic acid. But it's relatively easy to get a prescription for uh, for tretinoin uh, now, so you can try that out. And plenty of videos on YouTube uh, to explain how to how to use that effectively. the The next one um, is our very own torture device, um, micro needling or derma rolling. Uh, you can use this particular weapon of torture, um, or um, these are actually better. The, the derma pens. Um, they cause less damage, uh, and I think they're more effective. So this is actually my weapon of choice um, when I'm actually microneedling. The last one, and one that is somewhat interesting but still relatively new, is this whole area of monoxyl boosters. Uh, in fact, uh, you can now get I'm trying to get this so sort of like you can now get uh, these products. There are I think two sources currently in the United States market. This would be one of them. Um, and you can actually now buy this on Amazon. So this is relatively easy to get. Um, interestingly, uh, if you look on the back in the fine print, you can see the list of ingredients is pretty long. There's about 30 ingredients in this. Uh, one of those is retinoic acid, which we know is, is a upregulator of salt 1A1. Um, I will actually be doing a, a more detailed follow-up video on an analysis of what's actually in these boosters. Uh, and what I think the active ingredients are and how they'll work for you. Uh, but you can see from the chart, uh, I've actually transcribed the list of ingredients here, um, and I will actually do a detailed follow-up on that. It's something I am trying myself. Um, and, you know, this is, this again, if we can upregulate salt 1A1 in the hair follicle, um, then it will increase um, monoxidal to monoxidal sulfate transition um, and potentially give us that 14 times boost. Sometimes you'll see this mentioned in advertising as well, um, but I don't know if they've tested it for the individual uh, products. So that really summarizes what I know about minoxidil. Um, with people being less concerned about systemic use of minoxidil and, and now people prescribing oral minoxidil, that definitely adds another weapon we can use uh, in our fight against hair loss. Um, so the systemic concerns are, are pretty much gone at this point. Um, so with oral monoxidil and the various SALT 1A1 boosters or upregulators that we've covered, um, applying these can definitely improve um, how you benefit from monoxidil as part of your routine. Um, whether you decide to try oral monoxyl or stick to various forms of topical monoxyl and try and upregulate the salt 1A1 um, using uh, some of the products I listed. Um, I'm a good responder uh, to monoxyl. Um, I don't think I'm optimal. I think I can do improve. Um, and the two, the two open questions uh, for me and, and how I use monoxyl are, the first one is, um, do I use oral monoxidil in place of topical monoxidil? Uh, or 
is the opportunity to use both of them. Are the pathways uh, uh, different enough uh, and combining them can increase the overall level of, of minoxidil sulfate in the hair? That's an open question. And um, I actually think that uh, my current plan is to, is to use both. The second question uh, that is open um, is not whether you should use one of the techniques uh, or processes to upgrade SALT 1A1, but what about the combination of these things? Uh, so for example, um, you know, my routine uh, when I microneedle is microneedle, then apply tretinoin, and then later apply uh, one of the forms of minoxidil um, on the market that, that has a few additional uh, components that I like. Um, so um, with that, uh, we'll wrap the video. Um, I wish you all uh, happy hair and happy health. Um, please remember to like, subscribe, uh, leave a comment or a question, um, some subject you'd like me to discuss, and uh, I'll see you all next time.